can as well as you can for this opening game. Now you got three hours of fun. I'm getting goosebumps. Look at it. Just thinking about it. Opening day, bro. Anybody nervous? Anybody scared? <laughs> I think opening day is the most underrated day of the football season. I tell you, opening day is a special day. It's almost like a playoff game. Opening day to me is the best day of the football season. It's a whole new season. It starts the season, and this is what we do. This is this is what, what we're all in it for. Opening days are full of memorable performances, and we're counting down the top ten. Everybody says it's just another game, one of 16. It's not. These fans are alive now. This is what they've been waiting for. This is the beginning, babe, of a long journey. Here we go. Let's go play football. The emotion will be over the first time you knock the hell out of somebody. Here we go. Take a big, deep breath. And the season is underway. It's the examination. It's the test. Play fade. Back with time. Deep, he's We've looked at team and individual performances. Dallas wins in overtime. To find what we believe are the best opening days of all time. Touchdown, Dolphin. We've got great games, amazing individual efforts, and record breakers. The number 10 opening day of all time. Can you imagine any coach today winning 17 straight opening day games? It's unthinkable. Opening day for Tom Landry's Cowboys meant time to win another game. They say this all the time. Players take on the personality of their coach. And I think the players that played for the Dallas Cowboys really took on the personality of Tom Landry. Landry's intense preparation helped his team win every opening day game from 1965 to 1981. You don't win 17 straight opening day games by accident. First of all, the Cowboys were, were good teams during that era. They were good enough to beat the Giants, Giants again, Browns, Lions, Cardinals, Eagles, Bills, Eagles again, Bears, Falcons, Rams, Eagles a third time, Giants a third time, Colts, Cardinals again, Redskins. Tom Landry and that coaching staff did a great job of preparing his team for opening day. I think it had a lot to do with the preparation of Tom Landry. They took the extra steps to get deeper study, deeper research, I think, on all opponents. I think Tom Landry, when we take a look back at, hey, what did you deliver to the game, I think his approach to football changed the game of football. Training games were a place where you really see good coaches. <laughs> Landry's camps, I thought, were among the best year in and year out. In the case of the Cowboys, they were always ready. I'm gonna guess that Tom Landry spent his entire offseason plotting for that opening game. The only outfit America's team couldn't beat on opening day was the one team they couldn't beat in the Super Bowl, the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers began their 50th NFL season in Dallas, where the Cowboys had not lost a season opener since 1964. The Steelers couldn't have cared less. Perhaps the Cowboys' success on opening day had a very simple explanation. Well, I think it had to be Tom Landry's hat. Just, you know, the lid. So few people wore the lid like that, put it on, and boom, we win. We're 1-0 and because we have the lid. What a catch! Coming up, which Cardinal soared on his first opening day? Just illegal out there on the field. Touchdown! Here I am, stepping onto the NFL. 
plenty of memorable opening days didn't make the cut on our list. Everyone remembers Vince Lombardi's victory ride after his final game as Packers head coach. But he was also carried off the field after his first game as Packers coach. We were so elated and so excited that having won this first game for our new coach that we just sort of swooped him up on our shoulder. Steve Mariucci's first game as 49ers head coach was memorable in a different way. My first game as a coach is when Steve Young and Jerry Rice both got hurt against Tampa. My God. It's really hurt. If you're taking over a team and you lose Jerry Rice to a season-ending injury and you lose Steve Young to a concussion, you've got to be saying to yourself, what did I get myself into? That was memorable. I'm trying to forget that one. The number nine opening day of all time. Since his debut in 2003, Anquan Bolden has established himself as one of the NFL's best receivers. With Anquan, it's just sometimes he defies description. Anquan Bolden shrugged him off like he was dangerous. He made some plays that were just sick, flat out sick. Oh, Anquan Bolden just illegal out there on the field. Anquan Bolden to the rescue. You're talking about Anquan Bolden territory. You can't tackle the Quan. Oh! He just can't be tackled. This feisty Florida Stater slipped to the Cardinals in the second round. We would see Florida State play. We knew he was a great athlete. Arizona has selected from Florida State wide receiver Anquan Bolden. Arizona. I was like, man. <laughs> Anquan Bolden is the guy we had our eye on very, very early. I promise you guys, uh, he is going to be somebody that people can be proud of in this league for a long, long time. I mean, he showed up to mini camps and, and training camp. Our eyes popped. It was like, this kid's really, really good. Hands down. Here I am stepping onto the NFL scene. I think they knew what they had and they were kind of keeping him under wraps a little bit and they took the wrapping off in that game. Steve Mariucci wanted to take the wrapping off the number two pick in the draft. Hey, Lions Rock. receiver Charles Let's Rogers. Bolden was ready to steal Rogers' thunder in our number nine opening day performance. Here's my chance. Take advantage of it. He was unbelievable. And he took the league by storm. Everybody was like, who is this guy? Who is that? You didn't know much about him. He wasn't drafted real early. I think everyone knew right away that Anquan Bolden was going to be a superstar. Nobody expected that. Being young, <laughs> uh, having a good day, I thought I could make something happen. It was, it was unbelievable. Mariucci knew immediately he'd have to keep his eye on Bolden. We got to get that fixed. How many is that for him? About three? Let's get that straightened out. If he was on another team, I wouldn't want to see him. He's such a physical guy. He plays receiver like a linebacker. Let the quad run the football. He's doing everything. I mean, catching balls and running after the catch. and It was just stunning. This is a guy who literally could run through a landslide in flip-flops. Back to throw, gunning it to the right side. Bolden, touchdown! I was in the zone that day. His ability to run after the catch really caught everybody's attention. Couldn't tackle a guy. He made a name for himself on that day. The yards and the catches kept piling up in our number nine opening day. The reaching bull, Anquan Bolden. They're going to be bruised trying to tackle Anquan Bolden. Ball breaks free in midfield at the 40, at the 30, at the 20. Bolden cuts his back to the 10. Can't cover the quan? What in the living was that? I just feel like he can't guard me. Well, I feel like that every week. You knew then that he was going to be a special player. Bolden with a catch in the 45, breaks the tackle in midfield. Bolden with 10 catches for over 200 yards. He shined. He had 217 yards. I thought I don't know how many catches I had today, so I mean, I realized that I broke the record. What a coming out party that was. It wasn't a fluke because he's been good ever since. The number eight. Ironic as it may seem, Pro Football's World Series takes place the first week of the 1950 season as the Cleveland Browns, champions of the All-American Conference, take on the defending kingpins of the NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles. 
it was the Browns' first game in the NFL. They had dominated the All-American Football Conference. The Cleveland Browns were known for a revolutionary passing game thanks to their quarterback, Otto Graham. All you have to know about Otto Graham is 10 straight years in, in the championship game. There's a record that will never be broken. The Browns merged into the NFL, but the NFL wasn't impressed. The owners, the executives of the NFL looked down on the All-American Conference. They thought the players weren't as good. They thought the coaches weren't as good. They thought it was a minor league product. That really irked Paul Brown. <laughs> he got his feathers up. As the Browns prepared, head coach Paul Brown put press clippings showing the NFL's scorn in the locker room. He never made a comment about it. Never said a word. We... Few gave the Browns a chance against the Eagles. 1950, Browns versus Eagles. Uh, I was about as excited about that game as I've ever been about a professional football game. The NFL had scheduled them against the defending champions to teach them a lesson. That was no accident. I mean, Burt Bell wanted to put these guys in their place right away. The Browns fought the Eagles in our number eight opening day. They were just so much better, and, and I felt great watching it. They really went down there expecting to see the Eagles just embarrass this team from this other league. People in Philadelphia really thought the Eagles were invincible. They, they had a smooth team, some action we'd never seen before, especially in the passing department. I enjoyed that about as much as any football game I've ever seen. The Browns trampled Philadelphia. We had two touchdowns called back in that game. People don't realize that we could have had like 50 points. The first year in the NFL with all the derogatory comments were made by the press and so forth, winning it after on top of all that, that has to be the biggest event in my professional career. After the game, uh, Bert Bell came in and congratulated uh, me and us, and uh, he said it was the uh, uh, best football team, the most intense football team he had ever seen. Our number eight opening day foreshadowed the greatest upset in football history. I think that game was very much uh, was very much a precursor of Super Bowl three. The owners, the executives of the NFL, looked down on the All-American Conference, much the way the NFL looked down on the AFL. Those games are similar. A supposedly inferior league upset a league that that had a certain amount of arrogance. He's in there. I really enjoyed sitting in the press box and watching those stiff NFL faces. I felt like saying, yeah, you sucked a b Coming up, who was terrific in his first game in Tennessee? Eventually, you just get tired of uh, running into this guy, this beast. Easy is a key that you don't have to turn. The Dolphins debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. Opening day is full of famous firsts that didn't crack our top ten. The opening kickoff and races 95 yards for a touchdown. The season is only 15 seconds old. The Miami Dolphins scored on the first kickoff return in franchise history. That would have made our list if the expansion Saints hadn't done it the very next year. Another impressive franchise debut was a Texas feud. Texas Brian, the Texans were the toast of Texas when they beat down the favorite Cowboys. He's back in the end zone. He's in trouble. He's sacked for a safety. Darren Walker brings him down. Keep the ass. It wasn't no upset. Everyone knows Alan Amici's plunge in the greatest game ever played. Unitas gives to Amici on the horse, drives through a huge hole over the right side to bring the world's title to Baltimore. But his opening day debut was one for the ages. As the Colts face the Bears, Baltimore fullback Alan the Horse Amici takes a handoff and breaks through the bewildered Bears. The former Wisconsin All-American makes his initial carry in the Pro League a jackpot play by rolling 79 yards to a touchdown. for 216 yards.
In 1997, their first year in Tennessee, the Oilers had yet to be renamed the Titans and hadn't won over the fans. It's like, whoa, I can't believe how many fans are here. Well, they start booing us. It's probably 75, 80% Raider fans. The Raiders may have had the fan support in the Oilers' home stadium, but they didn't have Eddie George. Eddie George is the, the man now, I'm telling you, and he's determined. Eddie George, as a force, as a player, he was talented, he had credibility. It was about churning for those extra yards. It was about knocking people over. Eddie was the first real leader that the Titans had. George barely heated up in the first half of our number seven opening day under trying conditions. It, it was kind of a, it was hot. <laughs> But the Oilers' workhorse kept pounding away at Oakland. That's exactly what Eddie George was, a workhorse. He could wear down a defense without question, and he would not wear down. The Raiders pummeled Oilers quarterback Steve McNair. Eventually, head coach Jeff Fisher and McNair reached the same conclusion. Just give the ball to Eddie. We knew we were just going to pound him and Eddie was going to pound him. And, and that's pretty much what happened. I mean, he just grinded you down. Just an axe, man. Just chopping at a defense and then eventually the defense was going to break down. Oh, what a day for Eddie George. I mean, that's all, all Eddie George. Eventually you just get tired of, of running into this guy, this beast. Oh, what a, what a game for Eddie It was like a hundred and whatever. I remember we're just all sucking when he was hurting me. And this guy was made out of a piece of scrap iron. He turns to Steve McNair and he says, call something else. I'm dying. In our number seven opening day, George got the call again with the game on the line. George's two-point conversion gave the Oilers a 21-14 lead. But the Raiders sent the game into overtime. George has time. He fires for the end zone. Caught by Tim Brown for a touchdown. In overtime, George ripped the insides out of the Raiders. Eddie hit him with his shoulder and helmet and his gut, and he blew beads right there on the field. George's 216 yards rushing helped set up a field goal in overtime. Now Greco will shoot a 33 yarder. There's a placement. There's the kick on the way. And it is good. And the Oilers win. The Oilers win. It was a brilliant performance by Eddie George. The number six opening hit of all time. OJ Simpson's 250 yard game. When you mention the name OJ Simpson to somebody now, football is not the first thing that comes to their mind. But that wasn't always true, especially on opening day 1973. The thing that really made him what he was, was his ability to run away from everybody. He had sprinter speed, and you didn't really see that in people who were that tall and lanky. The New England Patriots saw it early and often. OJ was ready to run into the record books. O.J. Simpson was a big, powerful man, and he combined that with incredible vision and great balance. 200 yards for the Jews. He's going to break the record. Watching him play was just, just incredible. O.J. was the consummate player that you'd pay to see. The Bills' offensive line, the electric company, didn't just turn on the juice, 
The Patriots were so overwhelmed, Buffalo's other running back, Larry Watkins, had over 100 yards and two touchdowns. As our number six opening day neared its end, the Bills ran the same play over and over and over until finally OJ actually lost a yard, giving him an even 250 yards rushing on opening day, the NFL's single game rushing record at the time. Once they got that game, that 250 yards, it made such a powerful statement about Simpson and about that offensive line. That record game led to a record season, the first 2,000-yard rushing campaign in NFL history. And uh, the juice should break the National Football League rushing record in this next series. Simpson running left, Simpson breaking loose, and there it is! He's all right. All right. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards. Coming up, which Cowboy aired it out against the Redskins? Diving touchdown! Irvin caught it at the five! Touchdown! And who gave San Francisco a treat? We're counting down the top ten opening days of all time. Let's recap the countdown so far. Number ten, Tom Landry's Cowboys win 17 straight season openers. Number nine, Juan Bolden's 217 receiving yards in his first NFL game. Touchdown, and Quan Bolden! Number eight, the Browns beat the defending champion Eagles in their first NFL game. I enjoyed that about as much as any football game I've ever seen. Number seven, Eddie George's 216 rushing yards. Touchdown to the 20, left, to the 20, he breaks away, he's down to the five, he goes in! Touchdown, Eddie George! Number six, the juice is on the loose, rolling up 250 yards against New England. The number five opening day of all time. Troy Aikman throws five touchdowns against the Redskins. Number five. In 1999, businessman Daniel Snyder bought the Washington Redskins and their stadium for $800 million and almost got his money's worth on opening day. Without cover corner Deion Sanders, the Cowboys needed a miracle. Luckily, they still had the holy trinity of Troy, Michael, and Emmett. But Troy Aikman was mainly known as someone who handed off to Emmett Smith. The handoff goes to Emmett Smith. His first run, 45-50. He's going to score. Or he would just... I don't know if Troy ever had 30 touchdown passes in any one season. The Redskins took a commanding lead in our number five opening day. Caught. Touchdown! That's going deep into traffic. because a route may be on. Near side, stick to the five, to the end zone, touchdown! Aikman didn't need to put up huge numbers under his former offensive coordinator, Norv Turner, now coach of the Redskins. The way in which we attack defenses, I think, was his strength and his ability to call plays. The Cowboys, during the regular season, very often would get ahead of teams 21-3 in the second quarter. They could shut down Aikman. He'd end up being, you know, 15 for 21 for 180 yards. Not big numbers by any means. Now rivals, a mutual respect remained. He's as good as, as I've seen. Troy did what he rarely even attempted under Turner. He took over the game almost single-handedly. Aikman back, pressure, they pick it up for LaFleur at the goal line. Nice catch, diving, touchdown! Back he goes, rushed heavily, throws it, LaFleur catches it, dives into the end zone, another touchdown for Dallas. Wow. They gotta have this play. Aikman up and going deep down the left side. Irvin caught it at the five. That's an example of the Dallas Cowboys doing whatever they needed to do to win games. Aikman took charge in the fourth quarter. Touchdown! Aikman finished off our number five opening day in overtime. Third and a long two, almost three at the Dallas 24. Aikman, play fake, back with time. Deep, he's got Rocket alone. Rocket, caught it at the 40. Rocket to the 10. Rocket, touchdown. 
couldn't have happened to a better owner. <laughs> could, could, for all Cowboy fans, couldn't happen to a better guy and a better team. The number four opening day of all time. Jerry Rice breaks Jim Brown's all-time touchdown record. By 1994, Jerry Rice had established himself as perhaps the best wide receiver of all time. Well, he's certainly the best receiver of all time. He brought a little art form to the position of wide receiver. He entered the season with 124 touchdowns, two behind the all-time record holder, Jim Brown. I don't think there would be any argument at all that Jerry Rice is the greatest. I think you could say unequivocally that Jerry Rice was the greatest wide receiver that ever played the game, yes. Jerry Rice was only three touchdowns away from a record that had stood for decades. It was a Monday night game and everybody knew that Rice uh, was, was right on the threshold of breaking Jim Brown's record. The 49ers got the ball to Rice early and often in our number four opening day. And it seemed they wanted to get Rice the record under the Monday Night Lights. It was obvious right from the beginning that they're going for it. They're going to try and get Jerry touchdowns right away. Jerry Rice, he's got it! Touchdown 49ers! He is now tied with Walter Payton! Up next was tying Jim Brown at 126 touchdowns. It's a reverse to Rice. He takes off to the 25. He's to the 20. He's to the 15. He's to the 10. He's into the end zone. Jerry Rice has caught Jim Brown. One to go. Jerry Rice has so many records that it's, they're hard to count and try to remember. Rice in motion to the left side. And Young wants to throw. And he is looking for Jerry. And Rice is there. And he's into the end zone. He's done it. Jerry Rice is the touchdown scorer of the century. Held up the ball, held up his hands, celebrated. He knew that he accomplished something significant. The only reason Rice doesn't rate higher, he was so good, his records have become ho-hum. What was that, like Jerry Rice's 56th record in the NFL? He already had half of the NFL record book. They blur together. I honestly don't even know what records you keep anymore that Jerry Rice isn't a part of when it comes to catching football. To me, I just saw it and it was like, uh, it was just another record. I had no idea at the time that I'd ever be coaching the guy. Coming up, a shootout between a legend and an heir apparent. Touchdown, Dolphin. Bledsoe's fourth. Touchdown, pass. Well, that was one of the most memorable opening days uh, ever. Opening day often has some wild finishes. Kirk Slayton will take the punt snap at his own 23. Long count. Oh! In 1989, the Dolphins and Bills had one of their typical shootouts that came down to the very end. It was a game in which the Dolphins appeared to have it won. Final play of the game in Miami, the Bills were down, and it was going to be the last play of the game, there's just no question about it. Last play of the game, and he's going to run, and he dies for the touchdown! Jim Kelly is being mobbed, the game is over! That team just had the Dolphins' number. Kurt Warner threw for 441 yards against the Broncos in 2000. Kurt Warner, quick hitter, out the right side. It's a first down. Marshall Falk, plus the 40. Go, baby. He's in a danger territory. Go, baby. Marshall, the 35, 30, 20, 15, yes. 10, 5. Touchdown. And in 1951, Norm Van Brocklin threw for 551 yards, a single-game record that still stands today. We're coming up on 50 years now, and a 50-year period in which... The number of pass attempts has exploded, and the ability of Van Brocklin's record to withstand any and all attacks from every guy who's come along, from Namath and Unitas and Tarkenton, John Elway and Marino, is, is simply amazing to me. But amazingly, two of the top five opening day performances happened in the same game. And now the number three opening day of all time. Dan Marino and Drew Bledsoe. 
Allied So combined for almost 900 passing yards. Well, that was one of the most memorable opening days uh, ever. On opening day 1994, a clash of titans occurred in muddy Miami. The red dirt infield became this soupy mix. Moreno had uh, torn his Achilles the year before. He was trying to regain the form that made him one of the NFL's all-time best quarterbacks. What a throw by Moreno! Facing him was second-year sensation Drew Bledsoe. Bledsoe was absolutely positively the heir apparent. I remember thinking at the time that Drew Bledsoe was a big, strong-armed quarterback who had a chance to be great. People thought that he was the next great quarterback. Come on, Nashville. Come on, you're the Nashville. You're the Nashville. And he's at the five. He throws. Touchdown! 180! Touchdown! On the muddy field, neither team could run or even kick. They decided they might as well just pass in our number three opening day, combining to throw the ball 93 times. You got two-star quarterbacks going up against each other, slinging the football all over the field. Bledsoe and, and Marino, was, it was a gunslinger game. Marino slogging in the mud, back to pass. He throws downfield, has a man open. Mark Ingram has it at the 30. He's to the 20. Marino would end up passing for 473 yards and five touchdowns, and Bledsoe for 421 yards along with four touchdowns. Marino put on one of the all-time performances. He was incandescent. Gigantic play for the Dolphins here. He's looking, has time, throws it to the end zone. Keith Jackson has it. Touchdown, Dolphins. Danny Marino is back, baby. Bledsoe, to his credit, was matching Marino blow for blow. Back to throw Bledsoe, looking, fires it long and deep right side. Caught, touchdown. The day that uh, Drew Bledsoe was matching the great Dan Marino at the peak of his powers. You don't see that on anything but Madden video games. Late in the game, Marino brought the Dolphins within striking distance of the Patriots. He's got fire wide open. Touchdown, Dolphins! Miami! Marino, with the ball in his hands, last possession. It was fourth and six. Danny always had big ones, and they were made of brass. Fourth and six, you're thinking, let's get the first down, let's keep this thing going. There's some time left. Not Marino. It is caught by Fryer. Yes! Touchdown, Dolphins! Marino to Fryer! Bledsoe lost the game, but raised expectations. The sky was the limit. This guy was going to go on and win Super Bowls and assume the mantle and become the next great one. You came out of that game thinking Bledsoe was now was going to be a truly great one. Bledsoe ended his career good, but not great. Certainly no Dan Marino. He didn't know how hard to work because he never had to work for it. He never became Dan Marino. Our number three opening day proved Marino was once again the best passer in the NFL. What a game by Marino. You talk about championship courage. One of the great shootouts of all time. And uh, once again, Marino proves his detractors wrong. Coming up, an opening day game that ended in a lawsuit. Come on, his life was never in danger. The guy's soft. Ed Sable, the king of football. The Oakland Raiders of the 1970s were one of the most intimidating teams of all time. They weren't above a few extracurriculars. 
They saved much of their tough tactics for their rivals, the Steelers. And that's the way I thought it was meant to be played. We like it, you can't do anything about it. Mm. Guess what? This is for men only. You come over the middle, you're going to get hit. On opening day 1976, the Raiders had the Steelers right where they wanted them. We got them opening day. Ooh. Ooh, how bad do we want? Bad, real bad. Pittsburgh took an early lead. The Steelers are always willing to improvise. Franco Harris and John Stallworth created a touchdown as Pittsburgh ran up a two-touchdown lead with less than six minutes left to play. Those games were awesome. I love those games. Oakland quarterback Ken Stabler led a ferocious comeback and tied the game at 28 in the final minute. The Raiders won our number two opening day with a last second field goal, but this story was far from over. During the game, George Atkinson hit Lynn Swan with what Pittsburgh coach Chuck Knoll deemed a cheap shot. Yeah, we beat them opening day. Every time we beat Pittsburgh, they always had excuses, excuses, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we have been labeled as the criminal element of the game. We got accused of everything under the sun as far as cheating. The Raiders didn't take the charge lying down. Atkinson sued Noel for slander. Unnecessary for him to say. Shouldn't have said it. Now, was it Atkinson that cheap shot at Swan? Do you remember that one? That wasn't a cheap shot. What's that? That wasn't a cheap shot. It's the Raiders. We're going to hit you. Atkinson viewed the Steelers as hypocrites, just as dirty as the Raiders. I seen Jack Lambert grab fellas by the face mask, but you can break a fellas neck. I saw JT Thomas hit Ken Anderson out of bounds after play. The coach didn't label this as being dirty. He said that he was aggressive. I seen Mel Blunt hit Cliff in the back of the head. They had all the characteristics of an Al Davis team. They just happened to play for the other side. Many believe Raiders owner Al Davis was behind the lawsuit. He's been renowned for his contributions to the game and also how he's tormented it. Atkinson lost the lawsuit, but Chuck Knoll was forced to publicly admit his players used similar tactics as the Raiders. When you're a hypocrite, that's what happens. Your words come back and you have to eat them. And that's what he did. Coming up, who gave San Francisco a treat? He's out of the side! He's out of the end zone! Touchdown! We're counting down the most spectacular opening days in NFL history. Number 10, Landry's Cowboys win 17 straight opening days. Could you imagine any coach today winning 17 straight opening day games? Number 9, Antoine Bolden tames the Lions. 217 receiving yards. With Anquan, it's just sometimes he defies description. Number eight, the Browns plus the Eagles. They were just so much better, and, and I felt great watching it. Number seven, Eddie George runs over the Raiders. could wear down a defense without question, and he would not wear down. Number six, O.J. Simpson rushes for 250 yards against the Patriots. Once they got that game, that 250 yards, it made such a powerful statement. Number five, Roy Aikman's five touchdowns to beat the Redskins. Play fake, back with time, deep, he's got Rocket alone! Rocket, caught it at the 40! Rocket to the 10! Rocket, touchdown! Dallas wins in overtime! It could have happened to a better owner. Number four, Jerry Rice becomes the all-time touchdown game. Number four. What was that, like Jerry Rice's 56th record in the NFL? He already had half of the NFL record book. Number three, Ruben Dan pass everything but the tour. Incandescent. Number two, Raider Ranger spills off the field into a courtroom. Number two. Hypocrites always eat their word. And now the number one opening day of all time, Harrison Hurst, Brown the Jets. 
In 1998, Bill Parcells Jets faced the 49ers with a new starting quarterback. The Jets that day, I remember they, they had uh, Glenn Foley at quarterback. Freaking nerves! The 49ers had the future Hall of Famer Steve Young. Terrell Dackles in that going on there. Just relax, man. Everything's under control. Look at those unis, Shug. I'm waiting for Joe Namath to come out of the locker room. The Jets' old-time uniforms were awesome. I like them. The New York Jets are the world champions. And we remember the Jets in the Super Bowl and Maynard and Sauer and all those guys. George Sauer, Don Maynard, Bill Rademacher. Steve Young was brilliant as usual, but an unusual performance was turned in by Jets quarterback Glenn Foley. We knew if we executed, we had a good chance to win. All you can do is make sure you're prepared to play, and we were. This is fun, Steve Young. Foley would pass for 415 yards. With Corbett and Keyshawn, those two weren't real fond of each other, but as good a tandem you can have on a core, and they worked well together, so the quarterback shot was easy. Touchdown! Foley had a hell of a day. He was superb. So was Young. The only 49er really struggling was running back Garrison Hurst, meaning San Francisco had to rely heavily on their passing game. We have a, a doozy of a game, back and forth. With under a minute left, Foley drove the Jets into field goal range. End up tying, tying the game in, in the fourth, which he should have won. Good placement, and Hall's kick is good. As the clock strikes triple zero. Tie. Look, oh, we're going overtime. Huh. In overtime, Foley and the Jets were forced to punt punted the ball down to us, and we had to come off our goal line. Okay, they just want to get off the goal line. Like, let's get five yards. All right, we going to go 90 -o? Just make a first down. Give yourself some breathing room. All right, let's go 90 -o. 90 -o, be good with the ball. I always think of that play as a three, four-yard quick hitter. So we just call the play 90 -o. Come on, G. Come on, G. Wow, here we go. Hand off to Garrison Hurst, and boom. They've got to start from deep in their end of the field, and Garrison Hurst takes advantage of it. Takes the handoff. Wings to his right. Gets to the 20. He's on the 30. Needs to cut in. He comes back up the right sideline. Breaks a third tackle. Comes down to the 30. He's out of the 20. He's out of the 10. He's out of the 5. He's out of the end zone. Touchdown. Almost as amazing as our number one opening day was Steve Mariucci's reaction. I couldn't tell if we scored or not. Is it a touchdown? Is it a touchdown? It was just pandemonium in there. It was beautifully blocked, perfectly executed. Again, it was like a slow motion nightmare. A nightmare I still see sometimes. You'll see the stiff arm. He was good at, boom, hitting your helmet. Stiff arm him and it's like, okay, let's see if I can get this combo down the field. The NFL's top opening day performance was an all-time game finished by an all-time run. The immediate thing I remembered about the run was that you don't see many 96-yard runs. You just don't see it. You just don't see runs that long in the National Football League. It's so stunning to see a game end like that. That is like a walk-off grand slam in baseball. Some have called it the greatest run of all time. I don't like it. It's an honor. It's definitely an honor, but I don't know if I'll say right now it's the greatest. It was not the greatest run of all time. It's not number one. It was horrible. <laughs> Nobody quit believing, and we kept doing it, kept doing it. We just keep on playing. However long it takes us, we'll find a way to get it done. Good memory. That's how you start a season. You can argue the list, but it's clear that opening day has produced some of the NFL's top performances.